Well, it's not your average Thursday, is it? Welcome to Real Talk on this May 19th. Jesperson Hicks with you, and in just a second, uh, a special edition, an Alberta politics edition of the Real Talk Roundtable on this Thursday. We'll have back-to-back jacks, another Real Talk Roundtable. Guess what? We'll be talking politics again tomorrow morning. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for joining us today. This show presented by the team at Bitcoin. know that a whole bunch of people have a whole bunch of questions about what on earth is going on with Bitcoin right now. Values are down. People want to know why. People want to know if or when they'll bounce back. Now, nobody has all the answers, but when I have questions, I trust the perspective of the team at Bitcoin Well. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, it's not the case every morning that talk shows that focus on politics or sports both have more material than they know what to do with. But (laughs) that's the case this morning, isn't it? What an absolute barn burner last night. Game one of the Battle of Alberta. The Edmonton Oilers go down by a whole bunch of goals and then come back and then end up losing 9-6. And that wasn't even what everybody was talking about last night. That was this. I've been clear from day one that I will respect the decision of the members in this leadership review. And I expect all members of our party to do just that. Friends, while While 51% of the vote passes the constitutional threshold of a majority, it clearly is not adequate support to continue on as leader. And that is why tonight I have informed the president of the party of my intention to step down as leader of the United Conservative Party. I'm sorry, but friends, I truly believe that we need to move forward united. We need to put the past behind us. And our members, a large number of our members, have asked for an opportunity to clear the air through a leadership election. And I've recommended, therefore, uh, that uh, the provincial board schedule a leadership election in a timely fashion. That was Jason Kenney in South Calgary last night. You can hear, I think, fair to say, shocking his supporters in attendance. A hand-picked group. There were government ministers. There were MLAs that were not invited to that celebration, which said a lot. It was the Kenny. Loyalists. It was the Kenny faithful in that room, and you could hear the shock. The applause at the beginning when he said, I've told you that this is essentially a binding agreement. They're clapping because at that point, 51.4 was higher than what the premier had said he needed to stick around. He said 50% plus one. And the applause seemed to indicate that folks thought he would move forward in, albeit curious circumstances, with some justification to be accomplished, but no. You could hear the air sucked out of the room, the shock, the surprise, as Alberta's premier announced he'd be stepping down as leader of the party, triggering a leadership race. And more on that in just a moment, because it is possible and maybe even somewhat likely that Jason Kenney could come back to win this job again. He may not be done. He may see this as unfinished business, seeking another mandate to come back as the premier of Alberta. Before we go any further, we let you know how much we appreciate you participating in our Get Real Question of the Week every week, presented by our research and strategy partners at Wise Station. Back at the end of April, we left it open for a week, and we asked you to look into your crystal balls and and let us know how you thought this leadership review was going to land. And here's what more than 600 of you told us. When the results were put together, when the team at Y Station sifted through and calculated and finally presented it to us in our top line reports, the ones that our Patreon supporters receive in their email inboxes every Monday morning, you told us that you figured that Jason Kenny would receive a 49.96% approval. The actual result was 51.4%. And I haven't seen a poll anywhere else that was anywhere near to as close as where real talkers pegged this. So maybe this audience is a little less surprised than the people that were in that room last night. But it's safe to say that the province was in shock last night. 
And I think it's safe to say the province is still in shock today. We know there will be a United Conservative Caucus meeting today. I'm going to ask one of our next guests what he figures they'll be talking about. Of course, there's going to be a choice of an interim leader. And of course, there will be a leadership race. There are some queuing up who we know about, some that want that job. And there are others that may surprise us, that may emerge from the party or from outside the party. And Albertans will have a while, United Conservative Party members will have a while to think about, to ruminate on what this party needs to look like if it can be salvaged moving forward. Can it be? I mean, my, how the mighty have fallen. It doesn't take long in politics. If you look back to April of 2019, Jason Kenney was the first political leader in Alberta to receive more than a million votes in a general election. I will never forget, and you probably won't either, him riding up to the stage indoors at the Big Four Center in Calgary in that blue Dodge Ram, that blue pickup truck that made its way around the province as he campaigned and ultimately earned government in an overwhelming mandate. There were favorable conditions for this leadership review. People weren't gathering in Red Deer anymore. It was moving to mail-in ballots. There were questions around thousands of memberships that were sold, many of them purchased on just a handful of credit cards. People figured that strings were being pulled, or as I said in my tweet last night, that there were potentially, allegedly, shenanigans. People expected the premier, Jason Kenney, to not just win this leadership review, but to win it in relatively easy fashion. It's safe to say I'm going to call up an unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll that I ran yesterday and and show you exactly where people had this pegged. So why did Jason Kenney lose? I mean, technically he won 51.4%, but despite his insistence earlier that 50% plus one was enough, he knew the optics of 51.4 were just too tough to overcome. Ralph Klein was handed a 55% approval by his party members back in the day. Ralph stayed on for a while because he was still popular publicly. I don't know if that's the case with Jason Kenney anymore. He lost his caucus. He lost his constituency associations. They were starting to speak out en masse. We were seeing prominent resignations of presidents, longtime presidents of CAs. And ultimately, he lost the public. When? Where? Where? Different people might give you different answers. For some, he may have never had their support. For others, it may have been when he called for decorum and then handed out earplugs in the Alberta legislature. For some, it may have been when they were reminded about some of his past involvements, including in San Francisco, unpalatable to many people for a Canadian premier. And then, of course, we know through the pandemic, an almost impossibly difficult job we've acknowledged that on this show before a united conservative party leader a premier of a province like alberta being pulled on both sides some people insisting he was not doing enough many other people including thousands that voted in this leadership review believing that he was doing far too much but ultimately i think it's fair and safe to say that jason kenny created the conditions for his dismissal with his populist rhetoric, by whipping up people into frenzied anger, by creating maybe unrealistic expectations, but ultimately by drawing a certain type of supporter that can be fickle and ultimately that can turn. And that's what happens. The public didn't give him credit, or at least the party members that voted on this for high oil prices and a relatively balanced budget. That is clear. And despite what some of his supporters say, I have to wonder how the likability factor played a role into all of this. So the question is, what now? What happens to the United Conservative Party moving forward? Can the party still exist? Can it function as government right now? What does this mean for the NDP? What does this mean for the Alberta party, if anything? What does this mean for you as an Albertan? We'll be keeping an eye on our hashtag today, Real Talk RJ. And of course, we're keeping an eye on the live chat through this conversation. You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're going to take a look at what Twitter is saying today, at least what I'm seeing on my timeline. And of course, we're going to check in with our panelists 
in a quick second. First, I want to remind you that Athabasca University is Canada's online university. And for a lot of people, spring is a time of renewal, not just outside, not just in your surroundings, but maybe when it comes to your career, maybe your personal life. You're looking to better yourself, but you're not sure exactly where you're going to get started. We recommend the world-class accredited online programs and courses at Canada's online university. That's AthabascaU.ca. You learn at your own pace. You set your own schedule. And if you need it to be flexible, it can be exactly that. That's why thousands of people from coast to coast choose Athabasca U as their post-secondary institution. I mentioned our hashtag RealTalkRJ. That's powered by the team at Park Power. And if you visit them online right now at parkpower.ca, you can compare rates on electricity, natural gas, and internet. You can save even more if you bundle the three of them together, and you can save even more if you use the promo code 2022-REALTALK. That's going to save you $70 off your first bill from Park Power at parkpower.ca. And if you happen to be interested in going green, if you're looking to pursue a sustainable energy goal, there's good reason to check out kubienergy.ca. Not just because you can get a free quote right away, but also because they've got a great blog section on their website. You go to kubienergy.ca, click on the blog, and you're going to find featured articles there, including how you can tap into rebates and other financial incentives like the Clean Energy Improvement Program. Solar is more affordable, more reliable now than ever before, and nobody knows solar better than the team at Kubi Energy. Well, our three panelists this morning have insider understanding of how politics works in Alberta. It's a pleasure to welcome them to the broadcast. Erica Brutis is the founding president of the United Conservative Party. Uh, she joins us uh, in her role currently with Enterprise Canada. Thomas Lukasik is the former deputy premier of the province of Alberta with the Progressive Conservatives, now an entrepreneur with a number of different businesses. And Melissa Cowett is a longtime conservative political strategist joining us uh, she's the principal at MC Consulting. A welcome to the three of you. Thanks for making time for us this morning. Looking forward to having this conversation go where it goes. I want to invite you to jump in on each other. You don't have to wait for me to tap you on the shoulder to chime in. Uh, Erica, would you have been, uh, if you were in person there last night, maybe you were, I don't know, but would you have been one of those that gasped in shock as Jason Kenney tendered his resignation? I would say whether you were a Jason Kenney loyalist or uh, were hoping that he would, um, you know, not receive majority support. I think everyone's jaw dropped last night. And as you mentioned in the speech, you know, it kind of took off like it looked like he was going to stay. Um, he'd always said that that 50 percent plus one or 50 per, yeah plus one uh, was enough. And so I think everyone's jaw dropped last night, whether you were in that room or watching a uh, live stream, it was, it was a shocking night. So I'm coming here this morning. Oh, and two uh, with the Oilers loss last night. Um, so it'll be an interesting few days. Thomas, were you shocked or did you see this coming from a mile away? I don't think anybody saw it coming from a mile away, but I think it was abundantly obvious that he is not going to score much above 50%. The question was, how was he going to handle it? Uh, knowing Jason Kenney, I wouldn't have been surprised if he actually stuck around with uh, his 51%. Um, so the fact that he actually did the honorable thing was a, a bit of a surprise to me. Melissa, surprised or not? Shocked. I think that anybody who knows anything about um, Jason Kenney, whether you know him personally or you've been watching what's been happening over the past several years, he is a fighter. He's a political animal. He works really hard, like him or don't like him, agree with his policies or not. He is super... Um, super invested in whatever role that he has. And so I don't think that anybody really expected that he would, he would do this. Um, I think it is probably um, the best decision for him, given where things are at, even though it's very disappointing for a lot of people and very confusing for people within the movement. But um, yeah, it just, it's, he's a hard worker and he never shies away from a fight. And so I think for that reason, people were just sort of stunned that, um, that this is how things unfolded last night. I know a lot of people were not expecting it. So I guess the question is what happened? The question is, how did Jason Kenney get to this point? Uh, we put out an unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll yesterday, and 
And I asked folks where they predicted that Jason Kenney's UCP leadership review results would land. 1,305 votes. We left it open just for six hours. I wanted to close it before the results were announced around 7 o'clock. About a quarter of the respondents, 26%, thought it would be a failing grade, 49% or less. The majority opinion, 57%, and the poll did close before results were announced. So everybody gets credit here. 57% had him between 50 and 59%. 12 percent almost 13 percent thought he'd be between 60 and 69 and a four percent contingent thought he'd score 70 percent or higher so the majority got it right on the unofficial twitter poll erica how did it get to that point i mean based on your understanding of how the party works based on your understanding of mr kenny's leadership how did he wind up at 51 percent well i think as you you've been watching you could see that there was uh, a strong contingent that wasn't happy with him. Uh, I don't think there was a single moment in time that was really the the TSN turning point. I'll make a sports reference this morning. Um, but that we, you know, I don't think the pandemic helped. Uh, it was where we saw this province significantly divided, where we saw the caucus significantly divided. But I think that there's always been a need, um, you know, to finesse that caucus relationship from day one. Uh, there wasn't a strong understanding of how to be a government government caucus versus an opposition caucus. And we've seen that kind of be a little bit of a hiccup throughout this entire past three years. And ultimately, the pandemic, I think, escalated that and the divide. But ultimately, we're facing like the party is divided uh, based on that number. And so there's a lot of work to be done um, to, to unify the party going forward. Thomas, this was obviously I mean, we saw a lot of memberships being sold here. People wanted to participate in this leadership race and the speculation, especially with the public, some pundits as well, was that the Kenny team or supporters of Kenny were out there hustling and working hard. And I imagine they were trying to sell memberships to get those numbers. So how did it wind up at 51 percent? What, what's your analysis? I don't think it was a hiccup. Uh, Kenny's leadership from day one was fraught with with disasters, one after another. Another, and and what it really shows is that uh, Kenny was phenomenal as uh, Stephen Harper's number one lieutenant, the, the guy to go to, um, sort of a, a special game player. Since we're using uh, uh, sports analogies over here, uh, but he simply doesn't have the qualities that are required of a leader. And, and those are two different roles. To be prime minister's number one and to be the number one are, are two different roles. Uh, second of all, you know, Kenny, and I heard that term just mentioned a second ago, uh, Kenny in his mind thinks he's building a movement. They keep on using the word movement. Star Harper started uh, that terminology, but they don't know how to run a political party. Uh, if you want to start a movement, join some society. Uh, uh, but political parties are rigid. Um, there has to be control. There has to be clear leadership and, and, and a goal in mind. Um, and, and you have to know how to govern. And, and, and Kenny was lacking in all of that. So he had a caucus um, uh, purposely that he handpicked. So he can't complain about the caucus. Those are those were his people uh, of populists. Um, uh, and, and he gathered them around different ideologies, such as you would if you were forming a movement. But then when he brought them together and, and he wanted to govern with them, um, they were uh, they were a rambunctious group, uh, and, and he couldn't hold them together, which is which is very unusual. My concern right now, uh, if I'm at all concerned about the UCP party, is the fact that he's going to bring them down with him right now, and that is the reason why he's staying on. Uh, he made the first move of resigning; that was the right thing to do for a leader of a political party. But sticking around uh, is going to make the leadership race a disaster. He will always be in the camera. He will be commenting on, on what is happening in the leadership race and vice versa. Um, and it, he will make it impossible for this party uh, to go through a, a peaceful leadership race and, uh, and a change of power. So uh, it, it is his sort of underhanded way of saying, this is my party, I own this party, and I will leave whenever I want to. And Ryan, you were right, Ralph Klein did that. But Ralph Klein was extremely popular in Alberta. Albertans were actually uh, upset about the fact that he's resigning. It was the party and the operatives within the PC party that wanted Ralph to be gone. But Albertans wanted him to stay on. Um, Kenny doesn't have that mandate from, from Albertans, as, as we can see uh, from polling over and over again. So his staying on is his way of saying, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. 
Thomas. Ryan, yeah, I think can I jump in there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but you know, the first thing, as I said, like, we've got to stop comparing people to Ralph Klein. There's a lot of stuff Ralph Klein did um, publicly that would not, you know, be, be able to be um, Erica, even received. Kenny, Kenny himself compares himself to Ralph Klein. He even dressed yeah, up Yeah, and, and I don't Klein. think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. I think that we need to look at what 2022 looks like. But Thomas, I mean, you know this. Um, one, I think it'd be fair if you disclose that you have, you know, a personal vendetta against Jason Kenny. You have not been a supportive of his for at least a decade. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that obviously comes across in your tone, but ultimately we also have to look at, he didn't handpick those. I was the president of the party. He didn't handpick that caucus that was elected fairly. Yes. Obviously a leader, um, you know, recruits members to represent their constituents, but I think, and I'll admit, I think that a big challenge was on day one. Um, there wasn't a onboarding that was beneficial for all of that caucus. There was members that were members of the opposition um, and being an opposition MLA is very different than being government. And there was a whole whack of rookie MLAs that, you know, unlike Jason Kenney, haven't had their entire career in politics. And I think that that was something from day one that was challenging for this caucus to understand what it's like to be government and make tough decisions and have to live by that. And what stays in the caucus room, regardless of if you agree or not stays in the caucus room. So I think there's a lot of learning opportunities from both sides. I don't think Jason Kenney is the only one that um, had some missteps here on, on how a team works. But Erica, it, it is unusual that in Alberta, we had a government in power for 47 years. In all provinces, governments change every election. And we even saw Rachel Notley's government, you know, she had a 90 some percent of MLAs who have never been elected before and suddenly formed a government. And you have to admit that we haven't seen that magnitude of disasters from one to another uh, that Jason Kenney has had. It, it clearly shows that there was there is a lack of leadership. And, you know, am I a fan of Jason Kenney? Obviously not. But the, the fact is he he was not the right guy for the job. And and he was trying to run a very ideological caucus based on, on his beliefs. He recruited several members who are still loyalists of Kenny. Now we know who they are. And, and he couldn't hold this together. And, and, and Albertans, in many cases, just did not agree with his ideology. When he was making pragmatic decisions on economy and, and on other issues, I think he had full support among Albertans. But he just cannot help himself. He would always go into the bushes with, with ideological, crazy stuff, uh, populist stuff. And that's where he was losing support in caucus and in Alberta. And unfortunately, it is the, the, the Kenny feature that he just cannot help himself. You script him a speech and say, Premier, just read the darn speech, and he will take it sideways and go somewhere you know, into the weeds with it because he has these deeply entrenched beliefs, usually on social issues. And that's where he was losing everybody. I think this becomes an issue of like, what got you here won't get you there. I think like, I would, I would object to Thomas's point that he wasn't the right person for the guy, because I don't think that there's anybody else that could have taken the party to an election win like he did in 2019. Is there, was there room for improvement with how the actually governing aspect of things went? Sure. But I don't, I know of nobody else really that was present and active and putting their name forward within um, the context of the UCP family, if you will, that could have sort of taken that energy. And I think it, it, it raises another point of the leadership review was, do you approve of the current leader? And there's two aspects of the leader that you could look at. You could have looked at personality and his leadership style and who he was as a person, who he was at the legislature, how he acted, or you could have looked at principles as well. And I think that where a lot of people struggled um, in making that decision is that you you can't deny that um, that Jason Kenney, and you don't have to agree with everything that he did. I don't anticipate everybody will, nor do I think everybody should. But from a conservative principles perspective, Sean Spear had a really great article about this in the Hub this morning. <clears throat> he he was doing a lot of good principled conservative policy things. 
So it's, it's fair that a lot of people might have been torn because they were happy with the policy direction that the government was going in, but maybe not as happy with the other side of governing, which Thomas did mention in terms of um, managing the caucus, managing the party, all of those other things. And so I think it's important that we recognize that there are sort of two things that people were probably looking at when they marched their ballots for the review. Yeah. And, and, and never confuse political parties with families. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than using that comparison. And if they are, they're the most dysfunctional families that you have ever seen. The, the problem Kenny also has, that was a fundamental problem from day one. And I think Erica would have some, some insight into that, is that merging parties never works for a long time. And oddly enough, Jason managed to lose that merge while being in government. Usually premiers and prime ministers manage to keep caucuses together and happy because they're in power. So they can appoint people to cabinet, to committees, and, and, and sort of stroke their egos. Kenny couldn't manage to do that. But, but this merger of PC party and Wild Rose was a non-starter to begin with. Those were diametrically different parties with different cultures, with different beliefs and views. There were some commonalities, but very, very few compared to the differences. And the only thing that held them together was being in power and winning the next election. Usually that is enough to keep a party together, but obviously not in Kenny's case. And we're seeing an analogy of that happening right now with federal conservative party where reform and PCs were merged together. The, no longer are they in power and that thing is falling apart. Because these are two groups that should never be never be sitting in the same room, with the exception of several issues and and keeping this together. So I foresee a, a split within the UCP party, just like we will see uh, within the federal C CPC party, because half of the caucus doesn't belong with the other half of the caucus. There are very fundamental differences. Um, Kenny did a good job gluing them together, but obviously not well enough to keep it together. Now, I guess the question is, if Jason Kenny couldn't keep them together, is there somebody out there that could? And we'll talk about the party direction in just a moment. We're talking to Melissa Cowett. That's Thomas Lukasik and Erica Brudis on this. Uh, we're doing this live. It's uh, nine o'clock mountain time on this Thursday morning, 11 o'clock Eastern. Perhaps you're listening to the podcast later. We appreciate everybody that hits like and subscribe and shares our content. We also really appreciate our sponsors that are with us each and every weekday morning here on Real Talk. And that includes the team at Eden Landscaping. This time of year is when they start to really ramp up. They're looking at their clients' Pinterest boards and the pages they have ripped out of magazines, all those landscaping ideas that maybe you have to bring your outdoor space to life. You can find them online right now at landscapeedmonton.ca. It's full-service, custom landscaping from start to finish. They help you with the design. You don't have to subcontract anything, and they're not leaving until you're completely satisfied. It's how Mike and his team have stayed in business and grown that business for more than 20 years. Again, Eden Landscaping's at landscapeedmonton.ca. If you're lucky enough to live somewhere in Alberta where there's a Friesen Brothers, you probably know all about their famous sourdough. We've talked about it on the show before. We know that some of the Friesen Brothers bakers are audience members and they, they've let us know. They've let us know about the sourdough starters that, that have their own first names and they're beloved by the team. God bless those bakers. God bless those bakers at Friesen <laughs> Brothers. Don't get me started on the sourdough cinnamon buns. The seasonal sourdough is the sprouted grain sourdough right now. What is that? It's one of nature's oldest processes to make whole grains easier for your body to digest. When a grain kernel is given just the right temperature and moisture, it begins to sprout. And then it finds its way into Friesen Brothers Sprouted Grain Sourdough. For more than 65 years, Friesen Brothers has been Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. Infinity Healthcare, a proud Alberta company providing home care services to families that want to ensure they're doing absolutely everything they can to get reliable, trustworthy, perfect fit home care. This comes as a result of their personality matching service where your family sits down with a potential home care provider. You discuss things like cultural sensitivities. Maybe there's a language barrier. Maybe there are some specific priorities you have to make sure your loved one is able to age in place, to stay at home. 
as their care continues. You can learn more about the Infinity Healthcare process, their ethos, at infinity-8.ca. You can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website. And of course, don't forget as well, they're always hiring. There's career opportunities, including for healthcare aides and LPNs, licensed practical nurses. Infinity Healthcare is hiring right now. We're talking to Melissa Cowett, Erica Brutis, and Thomas Lukasik. This on the heels of Jason Kenney's shocking resignation as leader of the United Conservative Party last night in Calgary. The results of his leadership review, 51%. Erica, uh, we teed this up just before the break there. Where does the party go from here? Uh, A leadership race, obviously inevitable. That's what's next. Can the party survive it? Thomas isn't sure that the party can stay together. You think that the United Conservative Party can keep its you, so to speak? Well, I would definitely say uh, I don't always agree with Thomas, but I will on the the unity from day one. It was something that I was a member of both legacy parties and it it needed to have constant attention that a big tent conservative party or big tent party um, is always more difficult than when you have everyone in a close collective ideologically. So challenges from day one probably could have used a little bit more TLC um in throughout the whole process but forming government right off the hop like federal conservatives it took about a decade for them to get to a place where they really truly understood their values so you know they were kind of in warp speed from a party perspective it's still a young party but i do believe the party can survive this um you know big shoes in my opinion to fill because this is a man that you know unified brought the party together um and so for the next leader it they've got their job cut out for them it's not going to be easy um you know even today we'll hear a few that are putting their names forward and it'll be up to the membership to decide who is the best fit but you also have to remember that they're competing against a federal conservative uh race right now um we have you know a year to an election the party apparatus in order to get this all in place and and strike a committee to decide the rules um and and it it will will take at least six months so it doesn't give a lot of runway for the party it's going to be definitely an uphill uh fight for the party and the leader um you have rachel notley campaigning her heart out right now as she should be um trying to gain back support from albertans well you also have nominations for the party seats like there's a lot happening and a lot more happening for the United Conservative Party from a party organizational standpoint. So who's ever stepping up to to run for leader better realize that there's a lot of moving pieces, not just this is what kind of conservative uh, I'll be. And they'll have to focus on caucus relations throughout this entire process. Erica, what's the inside scoop? You say a few are going to throw their hat into the ring today. There's a couple obvious ones. I think Brian Jean and most people expect Danielle Smith will seek the leadership as well. Do you have the inside scoop on anybody else? Well, I did hear Todd Lowen might put his name forward, uh, which was kind of the 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 you know the one that I wasn't expecting. We'll see. I know Danielle Smith is doing an announcement today, and when you put it out after a leadership race, um, and you've expressed your intentions, you can kind of figure out that it's going to be a you know not a surprise by anyone. I think we'll see some caucus members, and I th- um, I believe that at least they'll have the insight of how the caucus currently functions and some opportunities for them to come together as a team. Um, so they're a little bit at an advantage there. And obviously, yeah, Brian Jean has basically applied for the job three months ago. Yeah. Um, so those won't be surprises. But I do think we you know we might see some private sector as we've seen in the past. Um, and you know, uh, there's probably a long list of people that are making some phone calls right now. Well, I've seen people tweeting. People want Ron Ambrose to come out of retirement. Uh, people want Michelle Rempel Garner to seek the job. Of course, the federal MP out of Calgary, Melissa, in the meantime, is, is this a lame duck party? I mean, is this a lame duck premier? What does this mean for the people of Alberta right now? I mean, he's essentially resigned from the job, but he's staying on until the replacements chosen. I mean, what are the implications? I don't think it's a lame duck situation. I think we have to, we need to know more after what happens in this caucus meeting and and what happens in terms of, is he staying on his interim? Um, Is there going to be a new leader? Obviously confusion is not great. um, And so close for an election, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but the party is also, or the government's also accomplished a lot in the last four years. So I don't know that um, that slowing things down as we enter into the summer on the legislative and policy front would really have changed the speed that government was going to move at anyway. Um, They're scheduled to, to rise in the beginning of June, and then they typically don't go back to the end of October. So I think a lot of the sort of behind the scenes stuff will be happening then. Um, I think that People are 
the biggest struggle, I think, for the UCP is, is actually the way that the NDP has positioned themselves. And the NDP, to their credit, have been um, really strong in terms of how um, they've positioned themselves and positioned their members over the last um, last couple of couple of years and, and couple of months for sure. They really are not as far left as a lot of other NDP um, parties within the country, and they've really tried to strike that pragmatic tone. I think they saw some of what was happening in the Conservative Party and tried to sort of position themselves. So it's all that to say it's going to be difficult in terms of. Um, where the UCP takes its tone um, in the interim and with the new leader, because it's hard to um, it's hard to differentiate yourself when you don't have like more space between uh, between that that side and and the other side. Not to say that we want polarization, but I think that the leader is going to make a big difference because it's going to be more of a personality thing, especially since the the economy is doing so well and things are generally generally speaking, going well for Albertans. And Albertans are generally going to vote for the way the economy is going. So I think that whoever comes into that role is going to have an easier time um, keeping the party in power. But again, there's all these other aspects involved in the role in terms of keeping the caucus together and not eating our own. Thomas, you. Well, I like that. I like that optimism. I like that optimism, but uh, unfortunately, I don't see it translating. I'm here all week with the optimism. This is like <laughs> yeah, I, love, I, I wish. I wish you brought some my way, but I, I don't see it that way. Number one, if Albert, you know, Albertans used to vote on economy, but if that was the case, Kenya would have about 70, 80 percent support right now because economy is actually starting to do really well. Obviously, it didn't translate even into his loyal members' support, party members' support. Never mind, General Alberta. But just imagine. How do you run your legislative and policy agenda right now? How do you even rise as a house when you have a premier who can't even whip a voting caucus anymore because you have 60 some cats in your caucus that will be voting any way they want because there is no clear leader. Who cares what Kenny wants, what Kenny's agenda and his whip's agenda and his minister's agenda is. Then you have five to seven leadership candidates, each one of trying to differentiate themselves somehow to win this leadership. So they will be commenting on this legislative agenda and saying how they would or would not support it or how they have better ideas. Uh, This government right now is nullified until a new leader is found because there's just no way to run a legislative agenda through. And and that is why, you know, uh, say what you want about Alison Redford, but she did the right thing. You step down and you allow caucus to, to appoint a new premier and there's no interim premier, it becomes a real premier. Dave Hancock became that. You run sort of this agenda light government for six months or however long you have to, and then you pick a new premier. But with Kenny pretending that he's still a premier and trying to run through legislation in the House, it it is going to be uh, actually I'm, I'm buying popcorn today because I want to watch this happen as a leadership race takes place at the same time in the background. It'll be interesting. Unfortunately, horrible for Alberta. Where are you getting that information from? Like he he never said he wasn't running. There's a caucus meeting to determine an interim leader. So that's up to caucus, not him. Um, they, you know, these people were elected on 375 commitments. You've got your playbook to to have that. You're also entering Erica, an election, Thomas. He hasn't Thomas. stepped down. He hasn't stepped down. But from caucus his role, Allison did it right away. Allison didn't right away. She stayed on for six months. Well, um, unless you, after she did that. From his, spe- from his speech, I gather that he's staying on until a new leader is selected, unless he reverses on it. And 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 I think he should stay. Sorry, down for clarification, right do you mean for, as MLA for Lockheed or as the interim leader? As as no, Kenny did not step down as a party leader and a premier. He's still the leader of the party and the premier. I think there was a lot happening last night that it could, you know, like, yes, I agree in the speech. It wasn't definitive that he wasn't doing that from from what I've heard. I mean, it's going to caucus to have that exact conversation today. Um, I think it would be totally fair if he didn't want to stay in this job uh, or if he did. Right. Like there's an agenda. He was just in Washington actually making we should be proud as Albertans the job he was doing there. Unfortunately, that didn't play into uh, the outcome. Ballots had already been casted, but he did show the type of leadership he can have on the international stage. And regardless, I mean, this is up to caucus and you were a caucus member in these rooms during this decision. You know that they they will decide what is in the best interest for the government as well as for 
sorry, my AirPod fell, <laughs> um, as well as for um, the the party, right? So you should have faith in this, like in a caucus being able to put the party first. And I think Premier Kenny did put the party before himself by deciding to step down um, as Premier last night and leader. Okay, Erica, also, Erica, Erica, Erica get the, get the from... earpiece back in so your, your audio will improve when the, air pe- when the uh, AirPod goes back in. So get that back in. Mel- are too small for these. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, go ahead. Just from like a practical perspective, though, like I do want to say it's not like we still have to introduce the budget. It's not like the majority of the legislative agenda hasn't already been introduced. Again, like I I can't remember if it's on the second or the ninth that the ledge was scheduled to rise already. So that's two more weeks. They were on a break week this week. So realistically speaking, it's it's more so just pushing through legislation has art that has already been introduced. And they they are not scheduled to go back until the end of October. So to to say that there is going to be months of a legislative um, sitting without proper leadership is, I just think, a bit of a stretch. Yes, there's still stuff that happens in government. There's still a cabinet to run. There's still announcements to run. But we are largely, from a political timeline perspective, entering into what we call in politics like the barbecue circuit of like going back into the community and talking to people. So, like, I take Thomas's point, and it's not like there's nothing to govern at this point, but to over sort of overplay how much is happening in the legislative sphere, I think is just a bit of a stretch. Well, and maybe and maybe that's the problem. Uh, if you if you think that legislature is a place through which you push legislation, maybe that's Kenny's problem number one. Legislature is a place where you debate legislature legislation, and the fact is that he will have a caucus who now will be liberated and will be saying things as they actually started very recently uh, that are not in line with, with, with the party and with the premier, putting him in a, in a odd position. But to Erica's point, you know, Erica, I, I don't know, and you may have additional information, but based on yesterday's speech, uh, it is my understanding that Kenny stays on as leader of the UCP party and he stays as a premier until the party chooses a new leader. In this case, caucus cannot do anything. They, they cannot remove him as a premier or as a leader of the party. Only the party has the chance to do it, and, and they didn't um, yesterday. So, so Kenny, as far as I know, is staying on uh, until the new leader is chosen. What Redford did is, uh, is she stepped down almost immediately and said, you caucus, find yourself a new leader for, for the time being until the party uh, elects a new leader. I, I don't see that happening here unless Kenny does another announcement uh, today or tomorrow and says, I'm also stepping down as leader and the premier immediately. Tom- Thomas, your timelines don't add up. Alison Redford's uh, leadership review is in November and she didn't step down till uh, almost six months later and then stayed on as an MLA for another six months. Um, so well, that's right. Immediate. But she passed her leadership review with flying colors. Like she Based on the score that she got, she didn't have to resign, but then she had a number of embarrassments and disasters. And when she decided to step down, she stepped down from everything other than MLA because she didn't want to create a by-election in that particular seat. Kenny is, is, is creating a situation that Ralph Klein created, where he's getting barely over 50%, but he chooses to stay on until the party chooses a new leader. Now, the, the, the big difference, as, as uh, Ryan mentioned, between Kenny and Ralph is that the whole province almost was behind Ralph. Kenny doesn't have that. So um, again, we don't know what's happening. We don't know this. Yeah, it's it's a (laughs) caucus decision and they can. We don't know. Yeah, a caucus can decide to remove them. (laughs) I, I can't I can't imagine just as a civilian uh the premier i can't imagine jason kenny staying on for for six more months after receiving 51 percent and saying he's leaving uh i i can imagine staying on through a time of transition maybe a couple of weeks type thing uh let me credit uh, just for interest sake and thomas i'd love to, to ask you i mean what what were the discussions like in caucus what were the discussions like in cabinet here's a timeline courtesy of ctv news they did the reporting on this uh, in cooperation with the canadian press this is back from 2014 this is the timeline that led to premier allison redford's resignation but in december 10th of 2013 you'll remember then premier redford uh, attended the memorial for nelson mandela in johannesburg uh that was what put airplane travel on everybody's radar and maybe that was ultimately her undoing was airplane travel uh in february finger pointing over that mandela trip uh started to become more prominent Uh, by february 19th of 2014 government records showed that redford's ea was billing taxpayers 
uh, more than $200 a night to stay at a hotel in Edmonton, right? That pissed a lot of people off. By the end of February the 28th, extravagant travel again. Uh, when the premier returned from Palm Springs to attend former premier Ralph Klein's funeral. Then on March 4th, Redford, then still premier, revealed that she had been flying her daughter and her friends on government aircraft. On the 5th of March, she acknowledged of 2014, she knew she broke the rules. On the 7th, the office said that uh, the premier needed to respond better to the high volume of correspondence from Albertans. So they brought on another staffer. That said something. By the 12th of March, she agreed to pay back $45,000, the cost of that flight to South Africa. Len Weber, a backbench MLA, resigned on the 13th of March. And then on the 15th of March, Redford met with the PC party executive behind closed doors, was taken to task there. She then had Associate Minister Donna Kennedy Glanz, who's been on this show before, obviously resigned on March 17th. Her house leader on the 18th said that MLAs who openly challenged the premier would be left alone for now. And on the 19th of March, she resigned. Four days later, Dave Hancock was sworn in on the 23rd of March of 2014. So it it happened either quickly or at a slow pace, depending on your perspective. But but that's how it all went down. So, Thomas, what's the conversation? What was the conversation like? Let's not spend too much time on the Redford legacy. But what was that conversation like? What are the priorities of caucus and cabinet going to be? caucus most especially and what do you think the conversation looks like today well caucus is really left at the mercy of the premier caucus cannot force a sitting leader of a political party and a sitting premier to resign they can implore they can beg uh, but they cannot make him there, there is no mechanism for that you hope that the premier does the right thing for his own party and for his own caucus and, and steps down um, we had a caucus meeting and, uh, and a large number of us uh, said to Redford, uh, Premier, you have to resign. And she did within two days of that caucus meeting and, and then immediately allowed for caucus to choose a new Premier. And that's what caucus gets to do. Has she not done it? She could have stayed uh, actually as a, as a Premier um, and leader of the party until, um, frankly, until the next election because uh, her leadership review, uh, the party quite supported her still. Uh, during the leadership review. So this will be an interesting dynamic. I think during the next UCP caucus, uh, brave UCP members will be imploring upon Kenny to step down immediately. And and if Kenny cares about the party, then he will do that. Melissa, can can you see Jason Kenny seeking the leadership again? Is that is that on your radar at all? A lot of people are talking about it. Yeah, I mean, anything is possible. I think, again, I know it's like fun to speculate, but it's just super hard to know what's going to happen before this caucus meeting. And I, I don't I don't want to try and think of what's in his mind. But yeah, it's possible. Um, he can't be um, interim leader if he wants to do that. Um, that's per the, 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 the documents for the party. So anybody who wants to be interim leader can't run for permanent leader. So I think if he's not interim leader um, after today, then maybe we can speculate more on that. But um, yeah, I mean, he, as I said before, he's a really hard working politician and very motivated. And he really excels in that campaign sphere of, of politics. And he's, he really, that is really where he shines. So I can see him being, you know, interested in at least considering that. Um, I don't know that that would necessarily be the best choice. Um, and I think that generally speaking within the party, we have to think about um, what's good for the party and thinking about the election in a year. And so I think that there would have to be some like noodling of how that's all going to work um, or how that's going to make anything sort of different um, because then you'd probably definitely have a split <laughs> that would happen. Um, but yeah, anything is possible at this point. And I think that anybody that says that they know exactly what's going to happen is lying to you because there are so many people <laughs> that are like, playing out different scenarios and testing different ideas. It's it's we won't have more clarity until next week it is my perspective. Erica, you know what I'm, I'm trying to speculate about? And this is all it is what it is. It, it, it's just an exercise, right? We're not proclaiming anything to be true or fact. Um, but I take a look at, you know, this this uh, this potential for a split. And the one faction is obvious 
right? If, if Todd Lowen's seeking the leadership or if Danielle Smith or Brian Jean even are seeking the leadership, although Brian's maybe an interesting one because I know he was flirting with the idea of seeking the leadership of the Alberta party. And I know that there was kind of that idea that maybe he could be rebranded as sort of a, a, a progressive conservative option or a centrist type option, a, a moderate conservative option. And whether or not that's the case, I don't know. Uh, but it's obvious that you'll have the sort of wild rose redux, right? The wild rose 2.0, the sort of social socially conservative, um, you know, strong in rural areas, probably strong in South Calgary, strong in northern Alberta, that party. We'll call it for now Wild Rose 2.0, whatever it, name it might have. The question I have is what happens with the other small C conservatives? What happens with the so-called moderates, the so-called progressive conservatives? Where do they go? Uh, the people that within the conservative party, the United Party, didn't believe the premier did enough on COVID. The, the people that want to see robust social programs, they're not thrilled with the way that the curriculum redo has been managed. Where do those people go if the party does split? I don't think it. we quite simply just draw a line and say, well, they go to the NDP. I know Barry Morishita is working hard to get him over to the Alberta party, but what do you think? Well, I mean, as we said, speculation, if we're going off my record in the last 24 hours, I'm 0-2, as I said, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but, you know, I actually think, um, you know, you're right. There, There is some members of the party in a big tent car party, you're going to have some more left, more right. Um, and that's going to be a big thing that the the people running for the leadership are going to have to talk about and say that, you know, we've, we've got to make decisions on certain things. For the people, uh, let's talk about kind of more progressive conservatives. Where do they go? Um, I mean, unfortunately, and I'll, I'll say this because I think it does take some NDP, you know, swing votes to the NDP, um, is we don't have a centrist party. And I actually think that that's, um, you know, or one that's operating at the same level of the other two parties. And so I think there's a lot of people in Alberta that don't feel they have a home. I do. Um, but there's some, you know, I think that are more on the progressive side that don't really feel like they can, you know, they don't want to quote unquote, potentially throw away their vote. Um, I don't believe Brian Jean is that person. I don't think his brand can can do that big of a swing. Um, but I do believe that you're going to see some of either the caucus or members from the progressive conservatives coming to uh, bring that contribution to the leadership and show that spectrum within the race on its own. But for voters, I think it's going to have to be, you know, then who becomes the leader? Can you vote for the United Conservative Party under that new leader? And ultimately, people, you know, might just vote NDP uh, if they're more centrist. Or, you know, let's hope the Alberta party gives maybe some options. I always like a vote split on the left. It uh, <laughs> usually helps my team. But do you, do you really think do you put the Alberta party on the left? Uh, I would say on a lot of uh, fiscal accountability, they're more left, um, you know, on on debt and things like that. So I would say, yeah, they're they're very, in theory, centrist, but with a little bit more um, or at least from what I've seen. Now, again, it depends on your leader and it depends on the policies you bring forward. And they're pretty quiet right now. So based on just going off of historical um, conversations with people that have been in, in leadership roles in that party. Mm. Thomas, where do you think this goes with with regards to that so-called centrist element, that faction? I think NDP stands to gain over here if uh, if Rachel Notley plays her cards well. Um, she her left she doesn't have to worry about the left flank of the NDP party because they have nowhere else to go and and they may get upset with her if she turns too far to the right, but they will vote for her anyhow because there's nowhere else to go. Uh, but she can definitely pick up uh, a lot of progressive conservatives, uh, people who are progressive on the social agenda in particular within the UCP party. Uh, because they will have nowhere to go. Um, I don't think Alberta Party is going to play into it in, in a big way. They may see a little bit of a bump. Uh, frankly, Erica quite eloquently you know, showed it. People don't know where the Alberta Party is. Is it right of center or left of center? So they may pick up actually from both ends a little bit. But I think the, the only person that can gain a lot from this mess is, is Rachel Notley if she plays her cards right. What does that look like, Melissa? I think Rachel Notley probably doesn't have to do a lot different than what she's doing right now. I think like the the sort of leadership play for somebody like Rachel Notley in the position that she's in is to keep a steady hand, keep doing what they're doing. Don't buy into the like Twitter arguments. Don't feed into the social media frenzy. Um, I think you position yourself as a stable 
alternative. And it, I, I do, doesn't look like they're going to be having a leadership brace or anything like that. And I, I think that you, you position it that way. And, and depending on what happens within the UCP, there, there might be a leader who's never governed before or a leader who's never had those roles before. And so somebody like um, Rachel Notley just has to, you know, it, it, who, who would have thought in Alberta um, in 2022, the NDP would be the ones to say, look at our record and look at what we've done. Um, it's just like stranger things of, no, yeah, Alberta politics always keeps it interesting. But I, uh, I pulled keep it steady. Uh, oh, sorry, Melissa, go ahead. No, that's it. I was done. Okay. I, I pulled some, t- <laughs> these are just pulled at random. These are some of the tweets that were on my timeline over the last 12 hours or so. Uh, I want to rip through a whole bunch and, and, and comment as you see fit. Jump in if you want. Uh, um, this Jason Markusoff, of course, has covered Canadian politics for a long time. Uh, says since the 2004 election, there have been seven premiers of Alberta. Only Rachel Notley served an entire elected term. How's that for a statistic? Uh, Councillor Aaron Stevenson, just west of Edmonton, wonders, did Kenny really receive 51? 51- 1.4% approval or did they give him a saving face number with the agreement he stepped down and not drop the writ what's the real that number? one I, I'm gonna jump in on <laughs> I was gonna say because that one man you could go on the UCP live feed and watch this I mean I don't know who actually did because I popped in a few times but like you could actually it was transparent at very best so all the critics that said that this was going to be you know a uh, corrupt process. I can tell you, like, and the party put a lot of work into having this as transparent as possible. Is it, so is it, is it, gonna, fair, Erica, is it fair to suggest, Erica, that some people had very good reason to question the validity of this process based on questions that stem back to 2017 and an ongoing RCMP investigation? Is it fair to suggest some people would have their doubts? No. Come on. What do you mean, well, no? Erica? I think it's, <laughs> it, it has a. Let's just look at this. Has the RCMP done anything? Like they've had three years. So I would say, you know, you're innocent. Erica, come on. You You sound like my former boss now, Thomas. (laughs) Thomas was my boss. Thomas was Erica's boss 10 years ago. Yeah. I should have said that in the intro. In in real life, she actually was the boss. I I just had the title. Uh, (laughs) Truth of the matter, Erica, the scary part is, that we are at a point in the history of our province where Albertans are openly believing that the system is rigged and and are accepting it, saying, oh, it's rigged anyhow. You know, that scares me because that shows erosion of, of our faith in the democratic process. And that's where UCP got us to. And you say, what did RCMP do? You have over 300,000 worth of fines from Elections Alberta for shenanigans in your leadership race from, you know, the the spectrum of cheating was very well covered by UCP from the financial end all the way to the ballots. And now we have a, for a first time, I think in the history of our province, we have a criminal investigation that is taking over two years with more than 12 constables working on it, where cabinet ministers and including the premier are being under consideration. So I'm not surprised. Well, that say, do, do you feel after and if they did, do you think that they can say that about this election, though? It was live streamed, sent to auditors like regardless, I, I, I do fit fair on the perception versus the reality. Um, but I, I think the party did a good job in addressing that and, and getting in front of potential perception. Yeah, yeah. So would you say that this was a transparent leadership race? I would perhaps, but it's scary. Or review, political- sorry perhaps I have no evidence to show otherwise, but it is from my perspective, pretty scary where a political party governing party in a province in Canada has to say, trust us this time. We're not cheating. Hmm. I will say this, and and I'm not saying that there was cheating and I'm not saying that there wasn't, uh, there was the live stream and I did drop in on it from time to time. Eric, it was interesting to see someone made a good point to me though, that you could watch the ballots being counted, but there was no live stream of who was selling the ballots, who was filling the ballots out and who was mailing the ballots in. So you could watch the ballots in the room being counted, but nobody knew how the ballots got there. I'm not trying to come across like tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying, I think it's reasonable that some people would have questions about the validity of the race. All in, though, it doesn't matter. It's done. It's 51%, and he's resigning. I mean, that's the story. Here's some more tweets that I saw. This is what other people were saying on my timeline. Uh, Bridget Sterling says, an unpopular opinion. She's a former Edmonton school board trustee. Uh, Kenny stepping down is bad, actually. She says it allows someone who wasn't in the legislature during the worst of this government to swoop in and pretend to be the savior of Alberta. 
an interesting one. Now, this one from Sammy Hoots pointing it out says through his time as premier, uh, Jason Kenney often chided NDP leader Rachel Notley for leading the only one term government in Alberta's history. Now he won't be finishing his own first term. Interesting take. Bruce Anderson, uh, national political commentator, oftentimes you see him with Peter Mansbridge, says Kenny's is a self-destruction story. A reminder for politicians who decide to win by ginning up anger and promoting mindless populist rhetoric. What goes around sometimes comes around. Too much focus on scoring points creates an insatiable demand for more of that all the time. That from Bruce Anderson and Tim Karengesser says Alberta exhausting today. Yes, but just wait for the next few months. That's some of the tweets that jumped out at me. Any observations from the three of you on those before I thank you for your time? I would just say, and this is very quintessential me to say, but I think that all of this points to the fact that democracy takes work. We are not immune to some of the things that are happening around the world that make people question institutions, make people question processes. And the people who have sort of political interest in putting those questions to the public. The reality of the situation is that we need to improve um, engagement in the public policy and political process, whether that's being part of a political party or just being an active participant in what's happening. We need to be more transparent in terms of how things work so that people actually understand the nuts and bolts of what happens in government and political parties. And we need to just create more of an open discussion that's not taking cheap points at people on social media because it gets us into the news cycle for a day. I, I realize that's not like the sexy option, but we're not in a great place right now with a lot of that. And so I think that we need to try to elevate the discussion a bit more. And I think that the public will appreciate that um, and will be more engaged as a result. And the quality of our democracy will be better as a result. And I think that's a win for everybody. Closing thought, Eric. This is a, so oh, go ahead, Thomas. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. I'm just shocked that this is a revelation uh, for the UCP party. You know, you reap what you sow. You form a government uh, on on fringe ideologies. You try to form a populist government. You gaslight daily. You have your staffers on in social media insult and argue with Albertans daily. You do gimmicks and fuel up your your truck and stuff at a gas station almost every second day to create a media opportunity. And and then you 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 have criminal investigations and and elections have been investigations, and then you're shocked that Albertans don't have confidence in, in our establishment in, in our institutions. Thomas, um, I don't speak on behalf of the UCP. I'm speaking as myself. Point well taken. Thank you. I, I sorry I had it <laughs> confused for I had it confused for a second. But uh, but uh, how can anybody in this UCP party be surprised that this is the outcome? And, and how can anybody be surprised that Albertans uh, undermine and and and, um, and and don't trust their institutions when 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 this is the the, the type of government that was presented to them? So you know it, it's unfortunate. But Thomas, it's a horrible thing the PCs, for but Kenny's getting exactly what he put into place. But when you were there, Thomas, PCs pulled stunts like this, gimmicks like this. The NDP did both in opposition, and then when they were government, like. I get it. I, I I take both of your points that, you know, we as individuals that, you know, are very engaged in politics. There's lots of people in our democracy that aren't um, as maybe engaged uh, or watching this as, as but their vote just matters just as much as ours. So what I would say to the UCP members is watch closely. Um, this will de define our party. Pick someone that you think, you know, not only aligns with your values, but we do have a strong contender uh, in Premier, or like in Rachel Notley running for Premier again. Um, she's held a job, so she does have a track record of what she can bring as a leader. So you also have to match up against your opponent. So please, you know, to the UCP members, focus on that when you're selecting your leader. And then to Albertans, engage in this process like everyone's vote matters we should have higher voter turnout than we currently have this election is going to be very very important for our province um going forward so you know i might not agree with how you vote or what team you like but you, everyone's everyone's vote matters and everyone should have a say that's I agree. erica brudis thomas lukasik melissa cowett a pure fire real talk roundtable and hey to the three of you I want to say thanks. We asked you to stick around for 20 minutes and you did the full hour with us, which is really, <laughs> really appreciated. It's all people are going to be talking about today. Well, that in the hockey game last night. But my thanks to all three of you. Thanks for joining. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you bet. You. Erica Brudis, of course, with uh, Enterprise Canada. Uh, Melissa with MC Consulting. And uh, Thomas is doing a whole bunch of stuff right now, an entrepreneur, um, I- including a new uh, Halal Mortgage Initiative. Fascinating stuff. And you can find all three of them, of course, on Twitter and learn more about their perspectives th- through that. We're going to get to more of what you were saying on Twitter last night. I want to bring you a thread of a dear friend of this show, Charles Adler, uh, that in just a second. And, and of course, we have to take a look at what happened on ice last night. I mean, that's the other thing everybody's talking about today. But first, let me remind you, if you're heading out of town, if you can't wait to feel the sand between your toes, if you're waiting to grip your driver on that first tee box, nothing but ocean and palm trees ahead of you. Well, and that green 350 yards away. If you're going to be leaving your vehicle at Edmonton International Airport, I recommend you park at Jet Set Parking. You can find them at jetsetparking.com. The promo code REALTALK gets you parking for just $7 a day at EIA. $7 a day. You can leave for a week and it's not even going to cost you 50 bucks. It's because you have the promo code Real talk at jetsetparking.com. It's super simple to use. You use your booking credit card to get in and out of the lot. You take the shuttle to the departures area. Smooth sailing. Enjoy your flight. Keep money in your pocket with the promo code Real Talk at jetsetparking.com. If you're sticking around, maybe your family's going to be heading out to the mountains. Maybe you're going to be pulling your fifth wheel out to your favorite lake or heck. Maybe you're just looking to downsize right now with the cost of fuel where it's at. No matter what you're looking for, they can find it. The perfect fit at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. They've got those sexy Ram 1500 TRXs. There's nothing that truck can't pull. Plus, they've got some great fuel-efficient options, including the new lineup of EVs, like that new Jeep Wrangler 4xE. I had a chance to drive the electric Wrangler. What a ride. A beautiful truck. You can find them at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you it is blizzard season and everybody's loving the special edition summer lineup, including the new all-star blizzard treat. That's the Oreo dirt pie I'm talking about. Cookie pieces, gummy worms, and fudge crumble blended with their world-famous soft serve. It is sure to be a fan favorite regardless of age. Of course, they've also got the Girl Scout Thin Mints Blizzard, the classic summer staple, the Drumstick Blizzard with peanuts, and of course, the Cotton Candy Blizzard is back at the Dairy Queens at Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. And our friends at Local Environmental want you to know if you're in Saskatchewan, if you're in the Edmonton area, if you're in the White Court area, in particular those regions, Local Environmental is looking to compete for your business they're your full service environmental solutions partner you can request a quote regardless of the size of your business today by visiting them on their website and you can learn more about what they're doing with recycling initiatives those big roll-off bins perfect for a home renovation and of course vacuum trucks water hauling for those of you living outside the city about to fill up your swimming pools you can do it with help from local environmental at localenvironmental.ca what a morning. A lot to talk about. Whew. It's already an hour and 10 in. That was fire. Johnny, it's almost time to wrap. I felt like that panel fire could chat. go on and on and on. Great perspectives from the three of them. Mm-hmm. And they've got different experience. They've been in those rooms, the strategy rooms, the party coming together and being formed. And of course, inside around those caucus and cabinet tables. Here's what more of you were saying. These are some more of the tweets that jumped out at me. Uh, These were on my timeline. Tamara at Tam I Was says this was actually my biggest fear. Jason Kenney resigns. They replace the leader. People assume it's somehow better. And then they stand a chance, the UCP does, of winning again in 2023. She says, I wanted him to go down with his sinking ship. The whole party is rotten to the core. Or we'd see UCP MLA sitting as independents. That's Tamara's perspective. What about this one from Greg? Greg says, I'm going to enjoy. This was last night. Jason Kenny's failure tonight. Tomorrow, I'll worry about who the fuck is going to be put in his place. <laughs> that from Greg. <laughs> Fair enough. A lot of people are saying, you know, the leader falls here. But but what does that mean for the party? What does that mean Could for the government? Could be even worse. Could so, be even worse, depending yeah. on your perspective. Here's who I feel for, though. I mean, really. The other Jason Kenny. His time is over. Out of... Virginia. Well, he's probably getting lit up last night. This is the guy, you know, so the premier of Alberta is at J Kenny on Twitter. This guy out of Virginia, he's been on the show. I think it was March 10th of last year. You have to watch it. A hilarious interview. He's at Jason Kenny last night, just tweeting. Well, dang, 
Of course, the two of them, the, love the two Kennys, it's over. <laughs> just met at the Canadian Embassy. Somebody wrote us an email to talk oh. at RyanJesperson.com to point out yesterday. They said they said the two Jason Kennys met at the Canadian Embassy. They said that's Justin Trudeau's territory wow. in Washington, D.C. But the two Kennys came together just a couple of days ago as the premier, Kenny, was down there fighting for access to American markets, Canadian oil, saying that Alberta could ramp up its production by 800,000 barrels a day. Do we have any more tweets? I don't want to leave any on the table. Ones I think that we've we run through them. Yeah. This is one I wanted to put in front of our audience as well. Charles Adler has just found new life. I mean, the guy's on fire lately. You can catch him every second Monday here on our show. Uh, last night he tweeted, you won't read a bushel of bromides from me about Kenny's contributions to Canadian democracy. Our democracy is in dire need of good human beings in positions of authority. Charles says, three years ago on my show, I gave him an hour to pass the human being test. He says he was flailing, so I gave several chances to self-correct. In the end, I even gave him the easiest test for redemption. I asked him to apologize for his evil behavior in San Francisco, working to deny dying gay men in hospice care, hospice care the chance to receive visits with their partners. Decades had passed. I thought he had grown. I was wrong. Couldn't even winch himself out of the ditch to say I'm sorry. Canadians were stunned by the cold, clumsy callousness, a Wizard of Oz moment, nothing behind the curtain. The big man reduced himself to a blithering buffoon. This social conservative, who always portrayed himself as a moral man, he's talking about Kenny, was, in the end, a hollow man. That night, many took a second look and saw nothing. Tonight, the king of nothing, after getting another fail, resigned. Good night, Jason Kenny, and goodbye. That from Charles Adler. I could hear his voice when you were reading that. <laughs> I, I won't try to do the voice because nobody can quite do the Adler. But that was, I remember I tweeted as that interview was happening. I had been on Charles Adler tonight the night before. Yeah, I remember. And Adler asked me what he should ask Kenny. Mm-hmm. He's, I said, hold his feet to the fire. This was around that Mark Smith candidacy. The, the MLA, he's still an MLA right now out of Drayton Valley that said gay love is not real love. You remember that guy? And Adler took Kenny to task the next night. It ended up being the final interview that Jason Kenny would ever grant Charles Adler. It was the last time they spoke. The two of them used to be chums. Just ask Chuck. And of course, we'll get him back on the show coming up to talk about this. We welcome your feedback to talk at ryanjesperson.com. And, and of course, tomorrow we're going to have a Real Talk roundtable that will pick up this conversation. We have some invites out. And if they are accepted, another it's going to be a banger. We could have three people on that roundtable that will all be either seeking the leadership of this party or seeking support for their party. It's going to be as you know lit saying. as the game last night, probably. As aggressive as... <laughs> I don't even know where to land on that game last night. We need a night. whole other show just for that. I like, mean, the Flames score about uh, like less than a minute in. I look at my pal sitting at the table with me, and I don't even know why. It, you ever put something out into the universe, and then it happens, and yes. then you just have to go for a walk? I was thinking, like, if they do that thing where uh, the first minute, and it happened, and then two in the first minute. Well, I, was, I don't know why I opened my big mouth, but I looked to my buddy, and I said, can you imagine if they scored another one? And bang, they did. And all real. of a sudden, it's 2 nothing, like a minute and a half, two minutes into the game. It's 4-1. All of a sudden, it's 5-1. The score starts to climb, and then the Oilers the start comeback. to come back. <laughs> it's tied up at 6-6. Ultimately, the Flames winning 9-6 in an absolute barn burner. You couldn't ask for a better start to this series, which has to go seven games. I've never seen anything like it, and I loved your tweet. <laughs> like, I could tell, I could hear you yelling in this tweet. You said, this is the greatest hockey game I've ever seen, and I'm old as F. <laughs> I'm old AF. <laughs> Unbelievable. And hey, you want to question whether or not this rivalry, we talked to Andrew Walker, host of The Hedge at hedgepod.com yesterday, and he said, I, he said, I feel like this rivalry has softened a bit over the years. Not at which, all. Which, I don't know, may have been true up until last night. Kachuk and Kane. Oh, man. Take that a look at this. Did you see like, this? Yeah, let's so go. Matthew Kachuk is probably the most talented agitator in the league, right? He had 90 plus points this year, but but he's kind of a real prick. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's one of those guys. You love him if he's on your team. You hate him if he's on the other team. Yeah. Everybody knows Evander Kane's struggles with bankruptcy, his gambling. money problems, his gambling issues. Well, last night you see Matthew Kachuk asking him, you need some money? 
you need some money right now he was rubbing his fingers and then he skates away and he goes you poor kid you poor kid i'm going oh Oh boy this is searing (laughs) stuff Game two, of course, tomorrow night in the Battle of Alberta. You can let us know where you land. So coming up tomorrow, Friday already, Sapria Devetti will be back with us after a week away. Looking forward to her in her regular Friday spot right out of the gates around 840 Mountain, 1040 Eastern. And then, of course, the traditional Friday Real Talk Roundtable. We don't know yet exactly who's going to be on it, but you will not want to miss it. It might give us some insight into what the political future of Alberta might look like. TBD. We'll talk soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Technical producer, John Hicks. Managing director, Josh Dunford. Account coordinator, Lawrence Sterlego. General manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.